It's a real joy to participate in this event, and I am very thankful to the organizers, in particular to Vinicius and to Eunice and all the others. I take advantage of this moment to tell you that we are in 2017 and not uh, 2016, as you can read there. So, I would like to start with uh, this line by, these lines by St. Augustine. He wrote, what is time? If nobody asks, I know. If someone asks, and I want to explain, I no longer know. So, this is very typical of all the basic and primitive concepts. Like, for example, we all know what is a straight line. But if you want to define it properly, you need an Euclid to make a whole treaty on geometry to define correctly a straight line. So, there are things that uh, we know and things that we think we know and they do not coincide necessarily. It enters another ingredient in this thing. I'm referring to this because sometimes people think that in physics in particular, uh, the definitions of uh, physical concepts, uh, physical variables is very neat and clear. It is not so. So, this is why I, I started with this example, and let me give you another example. The difference that Plato establishes between episteme and doxa, so this is knowledge, and this is opinion. So the knowledge is something objective, which in principle independs from any of us, but the opinion is subjective, and it depends on each of us. It is interesting the fact that this meaning for doxa, it was uh, at the time of Plato, so more than 2,000 years ago. Today, in modern Greek, doxa means glory. So our glory is our opinion, not our knowledge, but our opinion. It's an interesting uh, evolution. Finally, I would like to mention how human beings get out uh, from this kind of ambiguities. And uh, in Faust, Goethe put these words in the mouth of Mephistopheles. So Mephistopheles knows a lot of things because he is the devil and uh, he is explaining to Faust how we humans are. And Mephistopheles says, for at the point where concepts fail, at the right time a word is thrust in there. So when we do not understand something, we put it a name, like uh, time like entropy, and I will be talking about that. So we put a name. So we still do not know what it is, but then we are comfortable, because we all use the same name, and we think we understand. In fact, we think that we understand in similar ways, and this is why we communicate. But uh, if you think a little bit, uh, we do not understand in similar ways, and this is how we communicate. Not because we understand, but because we do not understand in similar ways. Trying to make this kind of things quantitative, Watanabe in physics, he focused this expression that he called surprise which is the logarithm of one divided the probability. So when it is almost certain that something will happen, for example, if you throw a coin, it will be head or tail. It's almost surely like that. 
So the probability is equal to one, 100% 1 chance. One divided by one is one, the logarithm of one is zero. There is no surprise when you throw a coin and it gets head or tail. But there is a very small probability, and it happened once in my life, somebody threw a coin and it stuck vertically. So it can happen. Very small probability, when it happens, the surprise is very big because the probability is almost zero. One divided by zero is almost infinity, and the logarithm of infinity is infinity. So if this happens, that uh, causes in us a big surprise. Uh, this logarithm of one divided by p appeared also a few years later in this paper by a great neurophysiologist from England, Horace Barlow, who analyzed the task of perception. And in this paper, he refers to the Selfridges pandemonium. So there is a letter A, and uh, this is the image demons. They see the A and other things around. They transmit inside. The feature demons process all this, and they go to the next uh, step, which are the cognitive demons, and that one says it's an R. And that one says, no, it's a four. That one is shouting, it's an A. The one that refers to C is sleeping. He said, this is not a C. And then all this information is transmitted to the decision demon, who then dictates it's an A. So this is how he describes our perception of things. Of course, Terence describes them in a much more uh, sophisticated way, but still this is quite intuitive and I think it's useful. And uh, he uses minus logarithm of p, which is logarithm of one divided by p, the same formula that Watanabe obtained in physics, precisely the same formula, excepting that he calls it unexpectedness instead of surprise, which is fine. And he says there are biological evolutionary reasons for this being very important for us and for other beings because this is the reason why I'm using a pointer which is red. And uh, this is in red. Why? Because this red point shouldn't be there. It's a surprise that it is there. And because it is a surprise, a big surprise, it shouldn't be there, you pay attention to it. And this is why I use it. And surely this, come, this comes from our ancestors. Uh, the red color has something to do with blood. And if a tiger appeared, we had to perceive it very quickly and run away. Those who run away quickly are in this room. The, others, the other ones, were extinguished along uh, uh, thousands of years. This is why we use the red spot. So, let me now go to a paragraph, uh, because remember this expression, logarithm of one divided the probability. I will come back onto this in a few minutes talking about entropy. So, in his book, Thermodynamics of uh, 1936, Enrico Fermi wrote, the entropy of a system composed of several parts is very often equal to the sum of the entropies of all the parts. Of course, an intelligent man like Enrico Fermi wouldn't write very often just like that. He had something in his mind. He had a counterexample. He was thinking of some specific situation. This is why he wrote very often, which I put here in red for the reasons that I mentioned for you before. 
And he says, these conditions are not quite obvious, and in some cases they may not be fulfilled. And we are, when they are not fulfilled, they can play a considerable role. So it is along that kind of lines that we will focus on this table, where you see here the classical expression of entropy within the Boltzmann, Gibbs, Shannon, von Neumann framework, where uncertainty is a logarithmic expression of the probability. And uh, this line corresponds to uh, the, usual, the usual entropy that I will be calling Boltzmann or Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy, which generates Boltzmann-Gibbs statistical mechanics. And I will come back on to that. In particular, when all the probabilities are the same, this expression becomes this expression, which is the famous formula, which is on the grave of Ludwig Boltzmann in the central cemetery in Vienna. So this is basically the reason for which uh, we vote to choose a president. It's because we do not know for sure who knows what would be the best president. If we, we knew that Vinicius knows what is the best future president of Brazil, instead of voting millions of people, we would ask him and he would say it is this guy. And that's it. But uh, we don't know who is the guy who knows with such big precision who would be the best president. So we give one vote to everyone. This is K logarithm of W. But I'm going to concentrate on this line where you see immediately there is an extra index, Q, here. If in this line you put Q equal to one or go to one, this line becomes this line. So I am not talking about an alternative to Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy uh, for all those cases where it works wonderfully well. I'm talking about a generalization because when we take here Q equal one, we do recover what has worked fantastically well in physics during 140 years. Now, the function p logarithm of p can be generalized in one million different ways, and it's very easy to generalize mathematical functions. So why that particular generalization? That's a long story that I don't have to tell you about right now, but uh, let me tell you that this is a kind of minimalistic Zen generalization of that one because it shares with that one practically all important properties excepting one. It shares concavity, extensivity, many other things, but it has to violate something because the only thing that violates nothing is p log p, and you have not generalized. When you want to generalize whatsoever, you must violate at least one property of the thing that you are generalizing. What we violate here is additivity. This expression is additive. This expression for Q different from one is non-additive. Remember the lines of Enrico Fermi about summing entropies. And I will come back onto this word. Now, we can define this function as Q logarithm of X, and when Q goes to one, this becomes the logarithm of X. The inverse function of that one is the Q exponential, which is like this, and when Q goes to one, this becomes the usual exponential function. I'm pretty sure that some of you are not very familiar with mathematics and might be a little bit lost with those expressions. But as you have already noticed, uh, human beings have the capacity of understanding things even if they do not understand everything. So don't worry. By using this expression, 
The same table that we just saw can be written in a more compact and elegant way. Log, log, q log, q log. And a mathematician said, well represented, half solved. So it's good to use this representation because then you don't need to be masochist and you go through the equations much more easily because you take advantage of a lot of things. But here you have the surprise or unexpectedness. So entropy is nothing but the statistical average of surprise the logarithm of one divided pi. So that concept that we were saying about the coin, whether you're surprised or not, if you, if you get the head tail or in vertical position, this is the essence of entropy. So it has a lot to do of, with our expectation about what is going to happen and the instrument, the mathematical tool that it is used is theory of probabilities. Let's go on. So let me tell you, since I defined here uh, entropy for the, with the usual surprise, here you have just a quite simple generalization with the Q surprise instead of surprise, because you have this Q here. But in what place of physics enter the concept of entropy? There you have a diagram. Terence was mentioning a couple of times the word thermodynamics. I will refer to it here in the specific use of it in physics. So here you have the microscopic world, here the mesoscopic world, and there the macroscopic world. So at the microscopic world, you have electromechanics, you have classical mechanics, Newtonian, quantum mechanics, relativistic, Einstein, Maxwell equation, quantum chromodynamics, whatever you want at the very basic electromechanical level. And then you have theory of probabilities. And together, together they generate the concept of energy, the concept of entropy functional. With this, you generate what is called in physics, statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics, when the system is very big, like the number of molecules of the air in this room, then you go to thermodynamics. But you can go through intermediate steps as well. And there you have a lot of important equations in physics, Liouville equation, von Neumann equation, Master equation, Langevin equation, Fo Fokker-Planck equation, etc. And through different steps, you arrive to the upper, more empirical level, which is thermodynamics. So normally at this level operate the engineers that decide what size of air conditioning they are going to put in this room. They take into account the size of the room, how many people are going to be here, if it is summer or winter or whatever, and then by using things, objects, equations at this level, they obtain the size of the air conditioning. But of course, the air conditioning has air, has fluid, has a lot of things that go there from here. And then little by little, you arrive to this level. So you do not need to know all the levels to work with a given level. And in particular, a typical engineer knows well this level and does not know much about those levels. Reciprocally, a theoretical physicist knows quite well these levels, but he would probably be incapable of designing the correct size of the air conditioning for this, uh, for this auditorium. So you see, the knowledge has a lot of steps, a lot of levels, and all of them are interesting, valuable, and uh, uh, useful for humankind. So here you have entropy at a very basic level. And because it is at such a basic level, if you change or if you generalize the entropy functional, you generalize a lot of things. Because entropy, like energy, 
they appear everywhere. In fact, I don't have time to go on to this, entropy appears as a concept in really everything on which we have information, whereas energy only on a part of those. So epistemologically speaking, entropy is a more subtle concept than energy. Energy speaks about the possibilities. Entropy speaks about the probabilities of those possibilities. So it is a second step, uh, epistemologically speaking. So, how this can be used in complexity? So let me uh, not define complexity, but try to characterize it and give you examples, because it's very easy to recognize a beautiful woman, but if you are asked to define what is beauty, then we have the troubles that St. Augustine had to define what is time. So complex systems can be identified with some facility, but defining complexity, that's another business. So I will try to illustrate these concepts through examples, uh, but not, I will not try to define complexity. Uh, not that I have not tried. I tried, but I did not succeed. So, since I do not succeed in defining complexity, I will just uh, refer to complex systems. Simple systems are characterized by short-range space-time correlations. No memory or short memory. Strong chaos, and this is very important, and you will see this appearing again, which means in a more technical language that the maximal Lyapunov exponent is positive, positive. This is an important word, ergodic, which means that time averages coincide with ensemble averages. I don't want to enter into technicality, but this word appears in the first two or three pages of any good book of statistical mechanics. It has a smooth geometry, Riemannian, Neoclidian. It has short-range interactions. It has no quantum entanglement, like the one that is needed to produce quantum computers. And uh, these kind of systems uh, exhibit lots of Gaussian distributions, the normal distribution. And uh, they are well adapted to the Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy, which is additive. This entropy is optimized by the exponential weight, which appears in a million of expressions and systems in physics, chemistry, computational sciences, engineering, you have the Boltzmann factor everywhere. The complex systems have all that kind of characteristics uh, opposite. They tend to have long-range space-time correlations. They can have long memory. They have weak chaos. Instead of positive Lyapunov exponent, almost zero or zero Lyapunov exponent. And remember this because I will come back on to this concept in a few moments. They are typically non-ergodic. They have hierarchical geometries, multifractal, fractal geometry. They have long-range many-body interactions, like gravitation. They have a strong quantum entanglement. They have, instead of many Gaussians, they have Q Gaussians, and I will define it soon. And many of those, but not all, are adapted to the entropy SQ, which is non-additive. Now, to have an intuition about how this goes, here, in the phase space of the system, where the macroscopic states of the system are described, you start from one point, which is the initial condition, and then that point goes around in the phase space. And uh, for the simple systems, it goes around like a fly. So if you wait quite long, at the end, 
it describes with uniform probability practically the entire phase space, and this is the intuition that Boltzmann him, himself surely had in his mind when he invented the concept of entropy and statistical mechanics. But these are like a spider. They do like this, in phase space. Like an airplane flying from Rio de Janeiro to Sao Paulo, or from Sao Paulo to Atlanta. They make this and then they go there because the pilot had a, an important instruction. You must take the airplane to the airport, not to the middle of the sea, not to the middle of a desert, in the airport. So the pilot said, but it's hard in the airport because it's so small. It's almost a zero Lebesgue measure set. Yes, and you must take the airplane to those zero Lebesgue measure sets. If you don't, either you will die or you will be fired. The airplane must go to the airport. That is a big geometrical restriction. But the heart of the difference between those two is in these two green boxes. This is the total amount of possibilities for n elements. So if you have <clears throat> n coins, you have two to the power n possibilities. Head, 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 uh, tail, etc. So the number of possibilities increases exponentially with n. Here, it increases like a power law of n. Very different, very different. So here, if you have coins and a new coin arrives and tells to the others, multiply your possibilities by the two that I like, which is head and tail. And the others say, no problem, this is a free country. We have two to the power n, we multiply by two, it will give you two to the power n plus one, and that's it. So, no problem. Why? Because they are independent. But remember, independence brings together a corollary that sometimes people forget in life. Independence means loneliness. They allow the number of possibilities to be multiplied by two, because at the bottom line, they don't care about that coin. They are independent. Here, our little coin arrives and says to the others, multiply by two the number of possibilities, the two that I like, and she likes head or tail. And the others say, are you crazy? This doesn't work like this. Here we have laws, we have constitution, we have music, we have poetry, we have Wall Street, we have earthquakes, we have big correlations. So no way that we would multiply the, our possibilities by the two that you like. But for you not being completely unhappy, instead of one million square, we are going to put one million one square. And the one is you, and be happy. The big difference between this and this. This is the difference between Boltzmann and what I'm going to describe. So, here are the two words that already appeared, additivity and extensivity. An entropy, and I'm using the definition of Oliver Penrose from his book, Foundation of Statistical Mechanics in 1970, an entropy is additive if for any two probabilistically independent systems, the entropy of the sum equals the sum of the entropies. Remember the words of Enrico Fermi about this property. If it is not so, then it is non-additive. In two lines, you can prove that SQ satisfies this, and therefore SQ is non-additive because it has an extra cross term here. So, 
Additivity is a very simple mathematical property. If you invent an entropy in 15 minutes, we will know if it is additive or not. Extensivity is a much, much more complicated business. Extensivity has to do not only with the functional entropy that you use, but also with the system itself, with the correlations inside the system, which is a big mess, which can be a big mess. So extensivity has to do with this, the entropy of n elements being proportional to n, to n. Not to n squared, not to logarithm of n, the entropy must be proportional to n. This is why when you eat an ice cream of 200 grams, you get inside the double of calories than if you eat an ice cream of 100 grams. So this is the basis of uh, the studies of nutritionists. They don't know how, it, uh, they don't know why it is so, why it is the double and not square root of two or three times exactly the double. If the ice cream is the double weight, you get inside the double of calories. They don't know why, but they use that and they make a science of that. Now you know why, because of this. So as I said before, you don't need to understand everything to do interesting things. So a nutritionist can make you slim without knowing anything about that. Okay, let me go back to those examples, assuming we have equal probabilities. So if it is exponential with n, the number of possibilities, you should use Boltzmann entropy, because if you take the logarithm of this, that formula, you get proportional to n, and that's okay. But if you have this family, and if you insist in using the formula of Boltzmann, the logarithm of this is going to be proportional to the logarithm of n. We don't want the logarithm of n, we want n. The difference is astronomic, especially if n is the Avogadro number or the number of molecules in this room. But if you use sq with q equal 1 minus 1 divided by rho, rho being the same number that you have here, then it is proportional to n. Ah, that's okay. So we sacrifice additivity to maintain extensivity. You might have other mathematical behaviors like that one, and then SQ doesn't work, and then you have to invent another entropy, S delta, for example, and with that entropy, this family also becomes proportional to n, and that's fine. Now, there is a remark that is important about W of n. This number is much larger than this number, which is much larger than this number if n is large. But what is this? This is the Lebesgue measure of the system, which means mu times mu times mu times mu in four dimensions, times mu in five dimensions. So it's the hypervolume, which is finite, if the system is mu times mu times mu, which means independence. Independence of this dimension with respect to that dimension, independence. Those are much smaller, and therefore they refer to zero Lebesgue measure, like the ensemble of airports that I was mentioning. It makes a big difference. Now, I gave a, a talk like this a few months ago in the Ecole de Physique et Chimie in Paris, where Madame Curie was professor and Paul Langevin and many others. And after that, we went to lunch, four or five people, and there was a, ranch, a Russian with us. And uh, he told me, I understood your talk. It's Anna Karenina. I said, Anna Karenina? Yes, Leon Tolstoy. I said, okay, I know that Anna Karenina was written by Leon Tolstoy, but 
what this has to do with my talk. He said, because the first line of Anna Karenina is this one. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The Boltzmann entropy has no index because there is only one way of being independent, which is this way. But there is a million different ways of being correlated, dependent, and Q is for that, to characterize that particular family of correlations. So I said, very remarkable metaphor, so I put it here. Aristoteles liked metaphor. He said, metaphor is of all things the greatest, the only one that we cannot learn from others. Well, because Aristotle didn't hear what Terence had to say about uh, human intelligence, maybe he would have a different opinion today. So here, in this table, you have a synopsis of what I was telling you. This is Boltzmann entropy, which is additive, SQ, which is non-additive, S delta, which is non-additive, and here you have families of correlations, independence, that one, that one. If you have this family, you must use Boltzmann entropy because it is extensive, and you must not use this or this. If you have this family, you must use SQ because it is extensive, proportional to N, and not this and this. If you have this family, you must use S delta. So, if you married Ludwig Boltzmann, you will live here until the death separates you. But let me tell you, there is a better marriage to, marriage, to marry thermodynamics or Rudolf Emanuel Clausius, which is this diagonal. The confusion comes because this diagonal and this column have a common element, which is here. And this is why, in the mind of thousands of physicists in the world, additivity and extensivity is about the same thing, it's the sum. It's not the same thing. I'm trying to explain to you precisely the difference. Why? This is a better marriage, because this is okay with thermodynamics. And why should we be okay with thermodynamics? After all, relativity is, uh, is not okay with Newton. And uh, we accept Einstein as being a correct description today. So why should we satisfy thermodynamics? There are several reasons that I don't have the time to explain to you, but I have the time to show to you one colleague of us that has the same feeling, that thermodynamics is very important. And he wrote in 49, a theory is the more impressive, the greater the simplicity of its premises is, the more different kinds of things it relates, and the more extended is its area of applicability. Therefore, the deep impression that classical thermodynamics made upon me, it is the only physical theory that will never be overthrown. He overthrew Newtonian mechanics, but he says, not thermodynamics. This is why the diagonal in the table is more basic than the vertical that you see here. So, when necessary, we sacrifice additivity because we want to maintain extensivity. The confusion of these concepts, additivity and extensivity, of different concepts, is not the first time and is surely not the last time it will happen in human history. In fact, the evolution of sciences could be written in terms of clarification of successive confusions in the minds of people. It would be a terrific book. Somebody should write it. But for example, very long ago, uh, 3,500 years ago, Tutmosis I, he did what was expected from any important uh, pharaoh to do. 
which was invade the neighbors. Some people still do that. They arrived a few thousands of, year, of years late. But at the time of Tutmosis I, they were very good astronomers in Egypt. And uh, the north was called along the river, along the stream of the river. North was that. And uh, here you have a what river? The Nile, of course, the only river they knew. And it goes and from black Africa and comes here. And here you have the Mediterranean Sea. And there you have Cyprus, where Venus was born. And they were all happy. North is along the flow of the waters. But then they invaded here, Mesopotamia, and they found the Euphrates. And the Euphrates goes from north to south and it goes into the Persian Gulf. And not only the astronomers were amazed, everybody was amazed, even the soldiers, because this was going wrong. Being wrong was very important because the Nile went here, which was infinity, turned up, it was the sacred river, turned up in the skies, made the, ast the, the, the planets and the stars to move, and then came back into black Africa, and there was the cycle of life. So what about this going the other way around? So they could not understand. And when they came back here, there was no internet at the time, so they constructed this and they wrote here, that strange river that when you go along the stream, you go against the stream. What about that? When you go along the stream, you go against the stream because two independent concepts, which is the motion of stars and the flow of rivers were confused in their minds because they only knew the Nile. Today, the kids in Brazil know that the motion of stars has nothing to do with the flow of rivers, especially because the Amazon does not go like this or like this. The Amazon goes like this. So everybody now knows that the flow of rivers has nothing to do. There is no confusion anymore. But there is still confusion between additivity and extensivity. This is why I'm talking to you. So these ideas look like very naive and uh, not dangerous at all. It's not so. Physics World and Physics Today are the two journals in physics that are for general readers. And they published a couple of years ago this article, Rollover Boltzmann. And there was a feature article, and it started with this picture. This is the formula of Boltzmann. And they sheared it here. And they called it Rollover Boltzmann. So, this writer who wrote the article, and the editor as well, they visited me in Rio de Janeiro and spoke lengthily with me, etc., etc., and they wrote this. And when it appeared, I called by phone the editor and I complained. Why you call this rollover Boltzmann? You saw that I have a poster of Boltzmann in my office together with Galileo and with Einstein. I have a big admiration for Boltzmann. Why you write rollover Boltzmann? And he said, oh, you know, because rollover Beethoven. And I said, what's that? Chuck Berry, you know, the champion of rock and roll. He was sick of his sister playing in the piano, Beethoven. And one day he did a famous rock and roll music and named it rollover Beethoven. And that's Chuck Berry. So we wrote Rollover Boltzmann. That's fine for a journalist, not so fine for me because it, it, it seems like I wanted to do that, whereas who wanted to do that was the journalist, not me. 
And uh, of course, this kind of things makes one immediately think about uh, Thomas Kuhn and his ideas about the structure of scientific revolutions. And there you have this example. He says three because he sees three. Uh, he says four because he, see, he sees four. And uh, you understand better because you are seeing the whole thing. And this is a time for a paradigm, for a paradigm shift. So these things, uh, he wrote to Thomas Kuhn a lot of interesting sentences, but uh, I'm only mentioning here when paradigms change, the world itself changes with them. This idea was not only of Thomas Kuhn, it was also by Niccolò Machiavelli. In the chapter six, he wrote this, which with Murray Gelman, the Nobel Prize of Physics, we translate it into English. And uh, he wrote, we must consider that nothing is harder to implement or more uncertain success, nor more dangerous to deal with than to initiate a new, a new order of things. This can be very dangerous. And the one who took notice very severely about that was Giordano Bruno, which some years after Machiavelli, he was burnt alive because he wrote these lines with which probably many of you will identify as very normal. He wrote in the universe, there is an infinite number of suns and planets like the Earth that turn around their own stars like the planets of our solar system. Uh, we see the suns because they are very luminous and very big, and we don't see the planet because they are small and dark, but they are there. And these infinite worlds are inhabited more or less like ours. So many of you probably identify with these things, but he was burnt alive for writing such things. So as Niccolò Machiavello said, it can be very dangerous to try to change the order of things. Now, let me go back to this index Q with this student at the time at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa. We calculated analytically the index Q for a certain class of systems, and we obtained this formula where C is called the central charge. And there you have this formula Q as a function of one divided by C, this line, at this point, you have the Ising model, which is an old friend of statistical mechanics. Here you have XY, another old friend of statistical mechanics. But this line ends here at 1, and that's Boltzmann-Gibbs. So there you have one of the most beautiful illustrations that we have nowadays that we are not proposing an alternative. We are generalizing Boltzmann. So you have the line, and the point Boltzmann is there. Q equal one, there you have the famous Gaussian distribution or normal distribution. Q equal zero is slightly different. Q equal two is different also. So when you work with SQ, you get a family of distributions, where, whereas when you work with Boltzmann, you get one distribution, which is the Gaussian. It was mentioned this morning, I think by Terence, you mentioned the central limit theorem. Somebody mentioned that. Yeah, it must have been you. So the central limit theorem is very, very important. It is called central because it is the most important theorem, theorem in theory of probabilities. And it shows that theorem that when you have a, all kinds of random variables, if you make the sum of them, the attractor is a Gaussian. And this is why there are so many Gaussians in nature. So the 
height of people is roughly a Gaussian, the, number, the concentration of melanin in the skin is roughly a Gaussian, uh, the weight of dogs is roughly a Gaussian. If a lady enters here with Chanel 5, we smell Chanel 5 because you have, among other things, diffusion. Diffusion is Brownian motion. Brownian motion is a Gaussian, so plenty of Gaussian. If we succeed proving for Q different from one, a generalized theorem, a generalized central limit theorem, then we will understand why there might be many Q Gaussians in nature as well. Not only many Gaussians, but also many Q Gaussians. So we tried this, it's not easy. I thought about this like 10 years. Finally, we succeeded with these two pure mathematicians. And here we have the generalization of the central limit theorem. And here, together with Mario Gelman, the Nobel Prize that I mentioned, we also generalize the Levig-Negienko central limit theorem. Of course, we don't have time now to enter into any details about these theorems, but we can have a look on this schematic table. If you have Q equal one, so basically independent elements, like the molecules in this room are nearly independent, if the variance is finite, the attractors are Gaussians. And this is why there are many Gaussians in particular. Have you noticed uh, an, incredi an incredible miracle? You have a cup of coffee, you put sugar a little bit here, you make with a spoon a couple of times like this, and a miracle happens. The entire coffee becomes sweet. How come? I put the sugar here, and I only did a little bit like this, and the whole coffee is sweet. Amazing. That's, among other things, diffusion, which is Brownian motion, which is Gaussian. This is when the variance diverges and the attractors are not Gaussian, but the Levy distributions. And these two theorems are in any good book of theory of probabilities. The two that we proved with these people are these two. In particular, that one, when Q is different from one, it suggests that there will be many Q Gaussians in nature. So we are going to look for them. And uh, this is an interpretation of those theorems by Fernando Alonso Marroquin, when I gave uh, one month ago a talk like this in, in uh, ETH in Zurich, where Einstein studied. And after the talk, this guy sent to me his interpretation. So, oh, I understand. So the central limit theorem is like a bug. This is like a spider. This is like a dragonfly. I didn't know what to put here, so I put spider vine. <laughs> now, in 55, Terhar, uh, a distinguished statistical uh, mechanical uh, physicist, he wrote this review, and uh, he said uh, the first man to use a truly statistical approach was Boltzmann. And uh, he found, uh, uh, but uh, it was funny, this expression kinetic theory, kinetic, from Greek kinesis, theoretic, kinetic theory of gases. So that means that the gases have motion. But Aristoteles said that the gases are fluids, and the fluids are in the mineral world, and the mineral world has no spontaneous motion. So the, just the expression, kinetic theory of gases, was something very provocative. So it took them 20 years to use the expression statistical mechanics. But he says, one might argue that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So you eat, the pudding, if you like it, you ask for the recipe. If you don't like it, who cares about the recipe, right? So this is how it works in science. So I'm going to eat the pudding for a few examples that I chose, and let us see if you like it. 
So I will start with this recent work by a Turkish, Ugur Tirnakli, and a Brazilian, Ernesto Borges, that uh, was very important because they showed in a very simple system what is the essence that goes around this generalization. So they used the standard map which transform xp, so position and velocity, into xp one time step later, again and again and again. And that map was introduced by Chirikov half a century ago, and it has this parameter k, the only parameter that appears here, k. And this is very important because it is area preserving. For those who know mechanics, area preserving is like a little Hamiltonian. So it plays a very special role in physics. And because this is only two dimensions, x and p, it's very easy to follow in the computer, where we will never be able to follow in a computer the motion of the molecules in this room. No way. Millions of dimensions, trillions of dimensions. But here, only two dimensions, so we can look at it. And they did. When k equals 0, 2, in the xp space, you have nice orbits. k equals 0 0.c, nice orbit, but a chaotic c appears here. k equal to, the chaotic c is bigger, but you still have the orbits. And when k equal 10, you have only chaos. There is no doubt that this is the picture that Boltzmann had in his head when he invented statistical mechanics and the concept of entropy. Every region has equal probability to appear. That's the essence, the essence of Boltzmann's statistical mechanics. But these figures, you can find them in any book of nonlinear dynamics. Not these figures, the originality of the Tirnakli Borges paper is in these figures, where they put different colors for different Lyapunov exponents. And here, for k equals 0 0.2, all of them are practically zero, whereas here, all of them are positive. You remember, you remember that I emphasized the simple systems tend to have positive Lyapunov exponents, and the complex systems have zero Lyapunov exponents. Of course, Boltzmann didn't use this way of speaking, because when he was inventing the concept of entropy, Lyapunov was a little child and has, had not yet invented his famous exponent. But the idea was already here. And I'm going to show to you k equals 0 0.2, where everything is practically 0, with k equals 10, where everything is positive. And look what they obtained. When it is positive, when k equals 10, big chaos, the attractor is a Gaussian. This is log linear, you have a parabola there, the computer gives you the red points, and this is a Gaussian. This is the central limit theorem. But when k equals 0 0.2, the Lyapunov exponent is nearly zero, and the system does not like Gaussians, does not like the central limit theorem that is in the books, because the variables are not independent. They are strongly correlated, and what the system likes? This dashed thing, which is a Q Gaussian, with Q equal 1.9, and not Q equal 1. This paper clarified very much the dynamical implications of this entropy, SQ, and uh, you can have an idea of that because Along one year of its appearance, it had over 2,000 full article downloads to, in the site of nature. 2,000 downloads in one year because it clarifies very much the dynamical concepts that are hidden in changing the entropy, in generalizing the entropy. Uh, 
how many minutes I still have? So, to arrive to 10 minutes. <laughs> no, no, because you are going to tell me about... Oh, okay. Let me, hmm, let me go quickly through this. Gibbs, in 1902, he wrote these lines. He said, if the equation 92 must be finite, if not, the law of distribution becomes illusory. What law of distribution? His law of distribution. He knew that his law of distribution, which is Boltzmann, Gibbs, weight, is not universal. It has some restrictions. That equation must be positive. If this is not true, it doesn't work. His statistical mechanics does not work. So he knew that. But people forgot about that. Many people, not all. And uh, here, you have a, a alpha, which characterizes short-range or long-range interactions. So when alpha is big, you have short-range interactions. Alpha big, you are here, like the air in this room, and you must use Boltzmann. But if alpha is small, you are here, and you must use something else. So I'm going to show to you the crossing along these lines, and uh, I'm going to focus only one example, the one that is going to appear possibly in uh, one or two weeks, which is this, which was done by a postdoc of mine from India. And uh, here you have log linear, the distribution of energies. A straight line here means exponential weight, the weight of Boltzmann. And here you have in log linear the distribution of velocities, the Gaussian, the Maxwellian distribution. This is, these are the most important features of uh, classical statistical mechanics. So when you have short-range interactions, you get Boltzmann from first principles, just by using Newtonian force equal mass acceleration, mass times acceleration. You get this, and this is what you will find in the textbooks, and it is okay when alpha is big. When alpha is small, it doesn't like it. It likes this, and this is a Q exponential, and this is a Q Gaussian. Let me make an observation here. What you are looking here is very indicative because in, in contemporary theoretical physics, there are five pillars. One of them is Newtonian mechanics, whose central tool is force equal mass times acceleration. The other pillar is quantum mechanics, the central tool being Schrodinger equation. Then you have relativity, Einstein, the central tool being Einstein equation. Then you have electromagnetism, the fourth pillar, whose central tool is Maxwell equations. And then you have the fifth pillar, which is Boltzmann-Gibbs statistical mechanics. And the central tool of Boltzmann-Gibbs statistical mechanics is Boltzmann weight. So here, it works when you have short-range interaction. It does not work when you have long-range interaction. So you are looking here at the failure of the central tool of one of the five pillars of contemporary theoretical physics. This is how these engineers from India have used this to detect cancer in mammograms of women. And they, using this, they went from 80% true positives to 96% true positives. So you can save 17 women more in 100 by using their techniques. Because those are microcalcification, and if you do nothing, this woman will die. But here you don't see it, but here you see it. So you can make a treatment. Let me go to the last example. It concerns the LHC in, uh, 
uh, CERN, this big machine that has 27 kilometers perimeter, and because it is so complicated, you need thousands of scientists and engineers to make it work. It's worse than a film. When you make a film, after the film, you have a hundred of uh, people, assistant, uh, sound, this, that, cosmetics, uh, a hundred of people, and nobody uh, is surprised. Well, here it is so complicated that you need a thousand of scientists, not hundreds. So, since a few years, they obtain permanently Q statistics, Q exponential in their experiments with the four detectors that I have. This is one of the detectors, one of these four. Look at the size of this compared to a human being there. So they were doing workshops on this. They invited me to go there. And uh, they took me down one of these, the Alice detector, with the elevator down the earth, with uh, signals in your eyes, etc. everything. It looks like James Bond. The only thing that was missing there was James Bond girls. The rest was there. And uh, they took me to visit the magnet. And when we arrived here, they showed to me this door, the door of the magnet. And they told me, guess what is the weight of the door? I looked at terrific door, I think, I mean, oh, many tons more than the Eiffel Tower. I said, you are kidding. Yes. It is heavier than the Eiffel Tower. Really? And it takes two days to close it. I said, my God, can you take a photograph of me <laughs> at the side of that door? And there you have the photograph. So here, let me show to you one example. There are Dozens of such examples in the literature, I chose one of them, on which we worked with a student of mine and uh, a guy from the United States and a guy from Poland. And here you have in log-log plot the data that they obtain in the experiment at CERN. And uh, there you have the Q exponential. And there you have Q equal one, this is Boltzmann. So in this region of energies, Boltzmann is not a little bit wrong, is trillions of times wrong. Trillions of times wrong, because this is a logarithmic scale. So here, there are two things that are remarkable. First of all, the talent of the experimentalist that in a single experiment, they could measure 14 decades. One, two, three, four, five, 14 decades. And those experimental data in one experiment on one system. And the second remarkable thing is that this simple expression that you see here, this one, a Q exponential, runs over the experimental data for 14 decades. And when I saw this, I was very impressed because of the 14 decades here. So I wanted to compare with something because I was thinking, I know what is 0 0.1, what is 0 0.01, what is 0 0.001, this I know. I don't know what is 0 0.00000000, 14 zeros, one. When I see that number, I feel nothing in my stomach. And a scientist should feel something in his stomach, in her stomach, when he analyzes the data. So I wanted to compare with something. But I couldn't find any other experiment that runs 14 decades in a single experiment in any area of science. So I decided to compare with the expression of Einstein for the for the energy, and there you have it. This is Newtonian expression of, uh, of energy, p squared divided by 2m in log log, and there you have Einstein, which coincides with Newtonian up to this point for protons, and after that is different, and the correct one is this one. And I plotted 
up to the highest energy that are detectable on Earth, which are the extreme energy cosmic rays, and from the departure between Newtonian and Einstein to the extreme energies, you have 11 decades, 11 decades. And here you have, from the departure from Boltzmann, you have 14 decades. So when I saw this, I said, my God, 14 decades is a lot of decades. Then I had some feeling. So I wanted to finish by telling you that there are many books about this, but also that uh, there are 6,000, or here, this, is, this shouldn't be there, 6,000 articles published by 12,000 scientists around the world on this theme. And these 12,000 12, scientists are here in countries, this is why we have computers. Uh, so the first one nowadays is United States, Italy, Germany, Brazil, and then the others, it used to be only Brazil at the beginning, 1988. But then all the others entered, and now there is China that started there, and nobody stops China, and now it's here, and it's going to, I think it's going to <laughs> go over United States at a certain point. So, let me finish by telling you a couple of thoughts, how these things can happen. A little formula that is generalized and leads to all this activity around the world, how this can happen. So, this is one thought that is relevant. Jean Cocteau, everybody knew it was impossible. There was one that didn't know that. So he went there and he did it. That's an important thought for this activity. The second one, from Montaigne, if the action has not some splendor of freedom, it has no grace nor honor. And the last one is this little story by Marco Bersanelli, who is a astrophysicist from Milan, and he was in Gutenberg, in the Autrician Hills, with his family, and they were going up. At a, at a certain moment, the little Sophia, three years old, she shouted, a strawberry, look, mama, a strawberry. And then the brothers went there and uh, they started finding as well, un altra, e dopo un po' guarda qui ce ne sono altre tre, quattro. The hunting was open. Uh, coming down from the same path they went up, they found more than 100 of strawberries. Zero strawberries going this way, more than 100 coming back in the same path, he says an incredible statistical fact. What had changed? We had changed. The strawberries were there, but we didn't see them. When we started to see them, we found that there were hundreds of them. Thank you very much.